The Bible reading today is taken from Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 26. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Let's pray before we look at God's Word together. Loving Father, we do thank you for your Word. Um, it is timeless. Although it is contextual and it was written thousands of years ago to people in very certain circumstances, Lord, by your spirit and by your sovereign will, it has just as much relevance uh, to us today, just as much power to give us life and freedom uh, and to challenge us as to what it means to live for you and to bless others in your name. So, Lord, as we hear from your word this morning, will you meet us? Will you speak with us? May you accomplish your will in our lives by it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there's a, a bit, a current debate uh, sort of floating around uh, between sort of left and right in some ways uh, that's been existing for a few decades now is uh, the source or the what's causing climate change. You know, most people recognize that uh, the climate is changing, uh, but some people will say, yep, it's, it's you know, human. Um, uh, in, in induced change, and others will say, no, it's just part of sort of the natural part of things and the way that the, you know, climate cycle works over thousands of years. So there's, there's a, a debate that goes on. So we know the effect on the environment uh, and of climate change, but there's debate about the cause. Well, good news is one guy called Chris from Albury uh, has it sorted. He has the answer for climate change. This appeared in the Albury Wodonga Border Mail. This is back in 2008, but he's, uh, he, he's nailed it. Let me read it for you. When I was a kid, we never had drought after drought. Then we started with daylight saving. We started with a little bit, but now we have six months of the year daylight saving. It has just become too much for the environment to cope with. It is so logical. For six months of the year, we have an extra hour each day of that hot afternoon sun. I read somewhere that scientific studies had shown there is a lot less moisture in the atmosphere, which means we get less rain. I believe this one hour extra sun is slowly evaporating all the moisture out of everything. Why can't the government get the CSIRO to do studies on this? Or better still, get rid of daylight savings. They have to do something before it's too late. Chris Hill, Albury. Well done, Chris. Just that's flawless logic, isn't it? Flawless logic, goodness me. Um, sometimes cause and effect is apparently not so obvious, is it? It's an interesting one. Um, we, we don't have time to go into all the, the um, aspects of that particular argument, but it's a, it's a funny one that illustrates that sometimes cause and effect is not as obvious as one would think. Well, today, Paul gives us a classic spiritual cause and effect principle, one that you would say is completely logical. In fact, one you might hear and think, well, duh, 
And yet it's one that appears many of us as Christians struggle with. Remember, as we've journeyed through Galatians, we've heard Paul declare that in Christ, we are free from a whole range of things. Free from regulations that always having to be good enough, either for God or for other people. We're free from alienation. Jesus has reconciled us to God. And we're free from idolatry, worshipping and chasing after things that aren't God. We've been freed from those things and we have been set free for loving others, as we looked at last week. No longer do we have to go along with the broken principles of this world of thinking of me first. I'm free to live the way God has designed me to live and love others as myself. And yet we saw last week that unless we embrace that which we have been freed for, we always revert back to that which we have been freed from. Now, someone said to me after last Sunday, thanks so much for the message, Phil. I love the thought that I'm now free to live a life of loving others instead of myself, but it's still really hard to live out. It absolutely is, isn't it? It's one thing to know that I'm free to do that. It's another thing entirely to actually live it out. It's not easy to grasp hold of the things that we have been set free for, but it is very easy to fall back into the slavery that we've been set free from. So it's great that Paul now goes on to reveal the key to consistently living in the freedom we've been given. And according to Paul, it's a simple matter of cause and effect. Have a look as he continues on in our passage today from verse 16. He says, so I say, live by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh or the sinful nature. Now, I've also included the NRSV translation here, and I want you to see if you can pick the difference. Just have a look and see if you spot the difference between the two and the significant difference in meaning. In the NRSV, the red, there are two imperatives, basically two actions described. One, live by the spirit and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. But this misses the sense of the Greek. The NIV, which is the more accurate translation in this situation, indicates that they are not two separate actions. They are one and the same. The second part is conditional on the first. Basically, if we do the first part, the second will take care of itself. Make sense? Live by the Spirit and you will resist the desires of the flesh. Don't live by the Spirit and you'll return to gratifying the desires of the sinful nature. It's a simple cause and effect. However, as we all know, that's easier to say than do, isn't it? And Paul explains why. In verse 17, he goes on, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. Paul is pointing out here the reality of the daily struggle we all face. Even though we have been set free from slavery to sin and wrongdoing and all of those sorts of things, even though we have been set free from the consequences of our disobedience, we still sin. We still disobey. We still uh, hurt others. Christians, believe it or not, aren't perfect. Even though we want to obey God, we want to live a life that's perfect, we don't always manage it and we often fail. We stumble, we fall short, we hurt other people, we disobey God because there is a battle between what our flesh desires and what the spirit desires. There is this tussle that goes on. And Paul goes on to give a description of the battle lines, in a sense. In verse 19, he goes on to say, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions and envy, drunkenness, orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Our flesh, the, the sinful nature within us, gravitates and desires this list. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit within us, produces the other. Now, firstly, looking at these lists, we see that they are basically opposites. The work of the flesh is described as a life of hatred, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. The work of the flesh is discord, dissension, and factions, but the fruit of the Spirit is peace. The work of the flesh is fits of rage, but the fruit of the Spirit is gentleness. The work of the, uh, of the flesh is selfish ambition, but the fruit of the Spirit is kindness. The work of the flesh is drunkenness and debauchery, but the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Paul is saying there is a clear distinction. This is the life we have been set free from, and this is the life we have been set free for. Secondly, it's important to recognize that there is a spectrum involved here. See in verse 21, it says, those who live like this. That's the Greek verb prosontis, which refers to habitual practice as opposed to isolated lapses. An occasional fit of rage or moment of sexual immorality doesn't disqualify us from the kingdom of heaven. But Paul says, if our life is characterized by these things, then we're not living by the Spirit. We haven't seized that for which we have been set free. And as we saw last week, if we don't seize that for which we have been set free, if we don't embrace a life led by the Spirit, we will just go back into the slavery in which we once lived. So it's vitally important that we understand what it means to live by the Spirit. If we don't comprehend it, if we don't embrace it, we will go back to the slavery in which we lived. Thirdly, when we look at these two lists, we encounter a conundrum. I don't know about you, but when I look at these, I know some Christians who live more like the list on the left and some non-Christians who live more like the list on the right. Have you noticed that too? Here's the conundrum in picture form. So this is a bit of a spectrum that we've looked at, you know, um, evil and bad, you know, as it goes down to that point as far as, you know, pure evil can get. And then good and perfect, the list that, you know, the, the fruit of the spirit list going that way as far as you can go towards perfect. Now, if what Paul said earlier is true, then surely all Christians would be up this end living good, upright lives. And non-Christians would be down that end, living horrible, evil lives. But no doubt, you probably know plenty of people who have no faith at all, who live beautiful, selfless, generous, sacrificial lives, yes? While some Christians, you might know, might be a fair way down this end. So does that mean that Paul is wrong? Well, no. What he's discussing is something slightly different. And a key verse to take note of is verse 18. It says, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. Paul would say, if you're a non-Christian, and let's, for example, place this as the, the red X, right? Someone who doesn't accept the free offer of forgiveness through Jesus, then it doesn't matter where you are on the line, you have chosen to remain under law and therefore guilty. Even if it's only a little bit of guilt, even if you only fall just short, unless you are literally perfect, guilt of some sort hangs over your head. However, if you're a Christian, hypothetically the green X, it doesn't matter where you are on the line, you are not under law, 
you are under grace and therefore considered righteous even if you fall short by a long way. However, and this is Paul's point in this passage, a Christian is to be led by the Spirit towards the fruit of the Spirit. You see, the Holy Spirit does not leave us where we are. He is the indwelling presence of God that compels and transforms us to the good. Not in an effort to become righteous, but because we have already been made righteous. So it doesn't matter where we are on the line. Paul's point is, are we allowing the Spirit of God to lead and transform us in such a way that our lives are moving towards this? You see, if you are a Christian and your life is not moving away from the acts of the sinful nature and towards the fruit of the Spirit, then Paul says, not only are you not embracing that which you have been set free for, you are choosing to turn back to that which you have been set free from. You are placing yourself once again under the law. We have been set free, not to live according to the sinful nature, but to live by the Spirit. Yes, we will always have moments where we lapse, times when we stumble and trip up in our lives. But the work of the Spirit is to transform us to be more like Christ more of the time. So the evidence of whether we are living by the Spirit is not necessarily where on the line we are, but rather direction in which we are moving. Make sense? Paul's point is that being a Christian is far more than just being forgiven. It also means being transformed. You see, we are called to be people who are moving away from the acts of the sinful nature and moving towards the fruit of the Spirit. We won't ever do it perfectly, but we should be doing it more and more. So I'm going to give an opportunity for a little bit of reflection time, a little intermission in the message. Remember those good old days where you got an intermission in the movies? This is an intermission. No Jaffa's available at the kiosk, though. All right. So at this point, I want you to take a look at these two lists and conduct a quick self-evaluation of your life. Ask yourself, which list does my life most resemble? Are there more spirit qualities in my life or more flesh behaviours evident? When I fail, and that's a when, not if, when I fail, are my failures isolated, you know, every now and then, or are my failures systemic? Do I have regular and repeated failures in my life where I succumb? And is there one specific aspect in which I fail more often and therefore need to be more aware of? For example, I might not have any problem with witchcraft, but I might struggle with jealousy. And Paul says, you don't have to exhibit all of these to be a really wretched person. He's saying, you know, Sometimes we can just exhibit one, but we might be consumed with that one. So I might not have a problem with witchcraft. That doesn't mean that I can tick off the list and go, sweet, I'm good. I might be <laughs> a terribly jealous person. And Paul is saying, if there are just occasional bouts of jealousy where you go, mm, yeah, wish I could have gone on that holiday. Yeah, it's, it's okay. We all have those moments. But if you are a discontent, a perpetually discontent person who constantly looks at other people and thinks, I want that. Why isn't my life as good as that? Why don't I get great opportunities like that? Then Paul is saying, you are falling once again into the slavery which you have been set free from. And then this is the critical question. No matter where you are on that spectrum, 
does my life demonstrate a movement towards the fruit of the Spirit? Does my life show that I'm submitting to the transformative work of the Holy Spirit within my life? That's all he's talking about. He's saying, oh, if you're down here, you should feel miserable and terrible. And if you're up there, you should feel really good about yourself. His point is to say, regardless of where you are on the line, are you being led by the Holy Spirit? Is your trajectory towards what the Holy Spirit desires? Because you might be way up this end, but start to move towards that end. And you're not embracing that which you have been set free for. Maybe you could take some notes down for further reflection later or to chat through with a friend for accountability purposes because this is important stuff. Have a think and a pray through this for a moment. encourage you to continue to think and pray that one through uh, not for the purposes of self-condemnation uh, scripture tells us that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus but it's an important area of self-reflection to ask ourselves am I being led by the spirit have I embraced that for which Christ has set me free now as I said before some on those lists we'd look at and go Phew, God, goodness, I, I would not be like that. It's pretty easy to avoid some of those things. But some of those things are areas that a lot of us will struggle with. We need to make sure that we're being led by the Spirit and not succumbing to the flesh that we've been set free from. Now, while it is the role of the Holy Spirit to bring about this transformation, this doesn't mean we just sit back and watch it happen. We have a very important and very challenging role to play in the process of our own transformation. <coughs> Probably, sorry, apologies. <coughs> have a little bit of a drink. Um, Paul goes on in verse 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Paul is saying that through our faith in Jesus Christ, we have put to death our sinful nature. We've been set free from it, and we now live by the Spirit. But in order to fully embrace this freedom, we need to keep in step with the Spirit. It's a great mistake to assume that because it's the Spirit's work to transform us into the likeness of Christ, that we don't have an active role to play. On the contrary, we are to walk intentionally and actively in the right way. We are to keep in step with the Spirit. This verb literally means to walk in line or to be in line with. It picks up on the imagery of a soldier marching in line in drill formation. Now, remember, Paul is writing this letter in the height 
of the Roman Empire. At a time when Rome was determined to assert their authority and victory throughout their empire. And so they would send out battalions or what were called maniples, which was a group of 120 soldiers in formation. And they would walk through the streets of cities, towns, and villages throughout the Roman Empire, including Galatia. Not for the purposes of battle or achieving victory, but rather to consolidate the victory already won, right? So that it was in the Roman Empire. So Rome would then send out into the Roman Empire these maniples, these groups of 120 soldiers throughout different cities and regions to march through in formation in a show of strength and consolidation of the victory that had already been won. Make sense? It was to remind the people in these places that they were under the control and authority of Rome. So that by the use of this imagery, Paul is telling these Galatians who saw these maniples, these groups of finely well-drilled professional soldiers walking through in formation, in line, he's telling us, uh, these Galatians and us, that the victory over the sinful nature has been won. But our job is to keep in step with the Spirit, to walk in formation with Him, led by Him, so that we reassert and remind the sinful nature that it has been vanquished, that it is under the control and authority of God. The battle doesn't need to wage anymore, for the victory has been won. But what he's saying is be led by the spirit, walk in formation in order to remind the sinful nature that it has been vanquished and you are free. Paul says this in another letter of his in Romans. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. Those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. That's what Paul means when he tells us to keep in step with the Spirit. If we keep our eyes on what the Spirit desires, then we keep in formation with him and consolidate the victory won by Jesus in our lives and live in the freedom he secured for us. However, if we take our eyes off what the Spirit desires and start looking at the things the sinful nature desires, We make ourselves vulnerable to attack and slowly and subtly find ourselves succumbing once again to slavery. So here's where we conduct another little bit of self-evaluation. Paul calls us to keep in step with the Spirit, to set our minds on what the Spirit desires rather than on what the sinful nature desires. So have a think about your thought life for a moment. When you get some downtime, when you're not preoccupied with the task immediately at hand and you get a little bit of brain space, what does your mind dwell on? What does it gravitate towards? The reality is for pretty much all of us, our minds will gravitate towards those things that we have been set free from things that stress us, annoy us, titillate us, anger us, scare us. But the thing is, if we allow our minds to be consumed by these things, we can't be surprised when our actions start resembling. If we dwell on things that irritate us, we will become irritable and grumpy. Guilty. <laughs> If we dwell on things that other people have that we don't, we will become a jealous person. Our behavior follows our thoughts, which is why Paul encourages us to set our mind on the things that the Spirit desires. In his letter to the Philippians, he encourages us to think about whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, whatever is excellent, 
or praiseworthy. I don't know about you, but I have to be very deliberate to stop myself thinking about things that frustrate or scare me in order to start thinking about things <clears throat> that are lovely or praiseworthy. But that's the way we embrace the freedom Christ has won for us. I don't know whether you see that in your life, but I find my mind so easily, if there's a bit of brain space, very, very easily to go to the things that frustrate me, annoy me, make me angry, things that I like to criticize in my conversation or in my thought life, am I more likely to look at something for the purposes of tearing it down or am I thinking about something to lift it up and to, to acknowledge it and pray, you know, things that are praiseworthy? Now, Paul's not telling us just to ignore the bad stuff or the hard stuff and pretend that everything's just peachy. In the verse immediately before that in Philippians, he tells us to bring our anxieties and requests before God. He recognizes that there are hard things in life. There are concerns that we have. There are burdens that we carry. But he's calling us to bring those before God, not in denial, but in allowing God to tackle those things and give us the space to allow our minds <clears throat> to be consumed with the desires of the spirit. So here's a challenge for you. After church, over coffee or tea, set yourself a little bit of a personal challenge to only talk about that which is true, noble, excellent, or praiseworthy. Some of you find, might find that that's a natural and easy thing to do. Some of you, however, might quickly become aware that your mind tends to go towards dwelling on what you have been freed from rather than what you've been freed for. Does that make sense? Analyzing our conversations and our thought life is really, really important. A really clear revelation as to whether we are being led by the Spirit towards the things that He desires or whether we are allowing our minds to dwell on the things of the sinful nature. If we do, we're doing that, if we're consuming ourselves with that, <clears throat> not the isolated sporadic stuff, but if we are consumed with what other people have that I don't, or that person did something or said something and I can't get over it and I dwell on it and it consumes me and I feed on it. All of these sorts of things, if we allow our minds to dwell on those things, then we are walking down the path towards slavery once again to that which we have been set free from. When we keep in step with the Spirit, when we set our minds on what He desires, when we dwell on the things that are true, noble, right, and pure, then we consolidate the victory Jesus has won. And we truly embrace the freedom he has given us. We've been set free for living by the Spirit. We've been set free for that kind of life. May we all embrace that freedom and live as free people this week. Let's pray. Lord God, all of us, in some way, shape, or form, know the reality of being enslaved by the sinful nature <clears throat> and by the dwelling on the things of the flesh. And Lord, we know that that is not a happy, free, or fulfilling place to be. Some of us spend a lot of our lives consumed with those things. And we feel entrapped, enslaved. Lord, help us to remember that you have set us free from that. That it is not your intention or desire that we would be consumed with those things. Instead, that we would be consumed with that which is true, 
noble, right, excellent, and praiseworthy. Lord, you have set us free. Help us to live in that freedom. Help us to live by the Spirit. Help us to set our minds on all that the Spirit desires. Help us to fully embrace the freedom that you have bought for us. Lord, may you help us do that, not only for our sake, but for the sake of those around us. Lord, thank you for the freedom you have given us. Thank you for the chains you have broken. May we live as free people. In Jesus' name, amen. The good news is that the Holy Spirit is the one who transforms us to be like that. We are not the ones who have to work and be better. He transforms us. But we do actually have a role to play in providing the environment for him to do so. What will you allow your mind to be consumed with this week? The things of the flesh, the sinful nature, the things that continue to enslave much of this world? Or will you choose to allow your mind to be consumed by the things for which Christ has set you free? Think about that this week. Be deliberate in allowing your mind to dwell on that which you have been set free for. Go in peace and live as free people. God bless.